All right, let's find our seats. Very good. We are, uh, we are very, check, check, check. Only for a moment, Ben. Check, there it is. We are uh, very blessed uh, this morning um, to have Pastor Rick with us. He doesn't need an introduction, but it's kind of fun to take a moment and just honor him uh, for, how, uh, for how awesome and wonderful he is. Um, I just want to say there was a time in my life when I was in, um, uh, in, uh, down in Gallupville, and uh, we're just processing life in that season. Uh, I just want to say thank you to Pastor Rick for just really... Just I was just thinking about that recently, about how what a Kayla would say. You got to call Pastor Rick. Got to call. Got to call Pastor Rick. I was like, I don't need. I don't want to bother him. I don't want to bother him. And uh, but I w I would spoke with you several times in that season of of um, of just trying to find the heart of the Lord and your wisdom and your help uh, just to get me to find Jesus was super instrumental at a very key moment in my life. And I wasn't, I really, though I knew you, we didn't know each other well, but I just want to say thank you for taking time with some guy so far away, just trying to seek the, the Lord. And uh, I think it was a year later or something, a year and a half later, whatever the season was where I, where I landed here. I just want to say thank you, Pastor Rick, for being there when you didn't have to be. I love you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, happy Father's Day to all the dads. Um, on Father's Day, uh, it's not necessary that we speak specifically to the fathers or a message about fatherhood. Uh, 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 but today I really felt impressed to do that. And so I'm going to be speaking a message in a broad sense uh, to the men in our midst. Uh, but ultimately, it's to all of us. I want us to pray. I'm really, I really feel uh, uh, a, just an, uh, an expectation in my spirit uh, as I'm ready to share this morning. Father, I come before you and I thank you. And I do pray for a spiritual deposit. Uh, Father, I pray that there would some, be something of your heart that's deposited in the hearts of everyone here, especially the men. And so, Father, I ask you to minister by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Father's Day is a day to honor fathers uh, and to also to raise a standard for what biblical fatherhood looks like, to honor fathers and to raise a standard. Um, and uh, when, we, when we think about honoring, of course, we have the uh, uh, command in the Old Testament that's repeated in the New Testament, honor your father and mother, uh, which is the first commandment with a promise. We find that in Exodus chapter 20 and then again in Ephesians chapter 6. In the Hebrew, the word honor is kabod, and that word means heavy or weighty. In other words, it means to give a, a place of value in that sense. Uh, you know, back in the, in, the, in the mid to late 1960s when we thought something was really like, wow, we didn't. We didn't. We no longer said neat. Um, we, you know, we, we. You know, that's not what we said was heavy. <laughs> Maybe you were there back then. Maybe you weren't. Um, but that's when something was like it's off the charts. It's the ultimate. You'd say heavy. It's actually a borrowed expression from Hebrew. In some ways, that's what the communication is. Um, honor your fathers and mothers. In other words, recognize the awesome value. Uh, that you have in them. In the New Testament, the word that's translated um, honor your father and mother in Ephesians chapter 6 is the Greek word timao. And that means to put a price on or to estimate. Um, uh, you know, I, I remember years ago, I never watched it much, but I, I remember on uh, uh, cable TV, occasionally we would watch a show where they would take their old stuff to, uh, to like antique dealers. Um, to see what it, I don't, I don't remember the names of these things, but uh, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. Do they, do they have just an old piece of junk, or is it really worth something? What you're getting is you're getting an appraisal, and the Greek word basically communicates appraise fathers and mothers as really valuable. In other words, place a high price upon them. Uh, so what we do when we honor is we recognize 
the, the way God has used the people who've gone before us. Um, we recognize the value and the sacrifices they've made to help us get where we are. The, we understand that we're the be beneficiaries of their labor, their sacrifice, their wisdom and achievements. Um, I, I want to tell you uh, today uh, that, uh, you know, 200 years ago, we didn't have cars and cell phones. Uh, that might come as a shock. Um, th th we're the beneficiaries of people who've gone before us, who've paid a lot of heavy, heavy prices, a lot of sacrifice to get us where we are. And even though, and this is important, even though sometimes we're aware of the failures of those who've gone before us, sometimes painfully aware of their failures, by honoring them nonetheless, we honor the God who chose to use them in our lives. We honor the God who chose to use them. You might have a very, very painful history with fathers or with mothers. I'm speaking broadly here. Exodus chapter 20, Ephesians chapter 6. Nonetheless, God used those people in a very specific and intentional way to get you to where you were and even to, in some ways, position you in history where you are today. That's an amazing thing. And so we, we honor God when we honor those whom he used. So Father's Day is a day to honor the Father. Secondly, it's a day to raise a standard for what biblical fatherhood looks like. Uh, what are we even aiming for? What, what is fatherhood? Um, you know, what's, what's the bullseye? If we could hit the bullseye, what is it? Uh, you know, when I was a kid playing baseball, I, I had a tendency to, to just, I'd watch the ball come in, and then I would tend to just swing wildly. Um, and so I would hear, you know, from my coach and you know, the others in the stands, keep your eye on the ball. Maybe, you, maybe you're familiar with that. That's baseball, baseball parlance for don't just, when the ball's halfway, close your eyes and swing wildly. There's something you're actually trying to hit. There's, there's a target. And I found, I discovered, well, we used to have a, a little uh, softball league with the, with the church here and some other churches back, I'm thinking 25 years ago or so. Um, uh, your brother Derek was on the team. so I, I You were? Okay. Um, I discovered my tendency when the ball was close to me to stop looking at it somehow. And I had to discipline myself to keep my eye on the ball to the point of contact, to actually say, I'm not just there to swing and look good like Casey at the bat. I'm actually there to hit something. What's the bullseye? I want to say to us today, the world doesn't have a clue of what the bullseye is for biblical manhood or biblical fatherhood. The world is lost. No compass, no gyroscope, no navigational system, no GPS, nothing, nada, zilch. I had a recent experience back in mid-April um, where I had the privilege of attending an event over at uh, SUNY Potsdam. Uh, Eric Trelease was invited by the, uh, the campus basic group there to come and give a talk on a man's purpose. And uh, it, was, it was a privilege. I'm so glad I was able to make it. I adjusted my schedule that afternoon. I think it was a Thursday afternoon. And I, and I, and I got there. His sharing was excellent, excellent. Uh, if you can get the notes from Eric, I would encourage you to do it. It was fantastic. Um, everything from start to finish. Um, but the event was, well, the event was well attended. Um, I'm going to say somewhere upwards of 100 people. Um, but what was significant was that half or more of the people were there protesting Eric speaking on a man's purpose. Um, right at the appointed time for, you know, about five minutes before the appointed time, I could tell that there were people kind of like milling around the student center. Um, and they had signs. And I started reading some of the signs. I said, oh, they, they're here to protest Eric's, Eric's presentation. Um, and about five minutes before it began, uh, somehow they made a signal to each other around the, the student center. And they all got online. They single file went in. Um, evidently, the students had to register as they walked into the to the event. I didn't have to register. Uh, they didn't. They didn't make me show my phone. Um, 
Uh, but they all lined up and they went in and I realized they're here to protest. They're here because without ever hearing the message of man's purpose, they knew they were against it. Uh, they came, they sat there, many of them held their signs up as Eric was speaking. And so he's sitting there looking at an audience, seeing some faces, but seeing all these signs. Uh, they're interrupting him as he speaks. He was very gracious. Um, uh, following, during his, his, his sharing, someone stood up and just absolutely just started shouting at him. Um, when he was finished, uh, someone came up to the podium, grabbed the mic, and insisted on giving a rebuttal. By the way, there were, you know, uh, people from the uh, student center, the director there, there was campus security. It was quite the event. I'm sorry you missed it. Um, uh, the following week, there was a lengthy essay in the racket, the SUNY Potsdam campus newspaper, um, uh, criticizing Eric as a preacher of hatred and abuse and declaring that his message had caused deep religious trauma to many in attendance. What did he say? What did he say that was so offensive, so upsetting? Um, I'm going to give you the short version. What he said was this. Men, it's time to grow up and man up. Men are responsible for most violent crimes. That's a problem. Men are responsible for most gun violence. That's a problem. Men are going around the nation impregnating women and walking away taking no responsibility for it. That's a problem. Prisons are filled disproportionately with men. It's time for men to grow up and man up, to move past a life of video games, to repent from sexual sins, pornography, and other things, to stop living for themselves, and instead to start living to serve others, especially their wives and children. That's the message he shared that was so offensive. That's the message that caused him to be labeled a, a preacher of hatred and abuse, someone who caused deep religious trauma. He was teaching in a wonderfully gracious way, and I mean that. He was teaching the biblical picture of true manhood, that of servant leaders, those who live for a purpose beyond themselves, those who show by their sacrificial service a living example of the heart of God. For that, he was mocked, jeered, cursed, and reviled. God bless Eric Felice. Again, if you can get his notes, I would encourage you to do it. In our culture today, the stage is set. There is a complete vacuum in our culture of any understanding of what biblical manhood or biblical fatherhood looks like. Where are the men of God? It's our opportunity to rise to the occasion. And the Bible gives us a high call to manhood. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give something to you today, brothers, and I mean this. I want you to, I want you to get this. I'm not going to lower the bar. The Bible doesn't give us a low bar. It actually gives us a very high bar. Um, sometimes we think, well, it's, it's high and I can't fulfill it. Why don't we lower it? No, that's not how it works. The bullseye stays the same. You know, in the last 20 or so years, I've, I've learned to uh, handle guns. I enjoy hunting, things like that. And uh, when, I, when I go to uh, my son-in-law Josiah's property and Luis's property to, to sight in my rifle, I, you know, I set the target out at 100 yards. And I'm very excited, you know, at the beginning of the year because I'm like, this year I'm going to get one. You know, it's going it's to happen this year. Um, I, I, I'm excited at the beginning of the year, very optimistic. And I walk back after setting up the target um, and uh, get to the place where, you know, I'm going to, you know, have my gun and I've got a place to rest and everything. And then I look out and I'm like, no way. <laughs> Do you know how big a bullseye is at 100 yards? I'm thinking, there's no way I'm going to hit that bullseye. And I'm tempted to say, maybe we could set it at 25 yards. <laughs> I do it my I give it my best. I give it my best. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a great shot. I got with my muzzle loader. I actually got it through the bullseye once last fall. I was I was shocked. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't change the bullseye. I do everything I can to try to hit the bullseye. 
I don't change it. The target is fixed. Brothers, the target is fixed. And as men, we're exhorted to grow up and man up and ask for the Spirit of God to, full, to equip us to fulfill the call, to take in the Word of God to inspire us and refresh us in the call, not to change the standard, not to lower the mark, not to make the bullseye easier, but to say, God, that's a high standard. There's a wonderful book some of you are familiar with. It's called The Mark of a Man written by a woman, Elizabeth Elliot. Um, in the book, in one of the sections, she speaks about the tremendous call upon men, one that requires incredible sacrifice, and that it's actually a high bar. And she says, no, we're not going to lower the bar. We're going to ask God to help us. It's hard. It's hard to aim at sacrificially loving others instead of aiming at being loved. But she makes it clear. Just because it's hard, we don't lower the bar. Listen to what Elizabeth Elliot wrote in The Mark of a Man. To aim at loving instead of at being loved requires sacrifice. Love reaches out willing to be turned down or inconvenienced, expecting no personal reward, waiting only to give. But that's an impossible standard for a human being's love, you'll say. You're not everlasting love, referring to the Lord himself. Far from it. She continues, the unavoidable fact, however, is that this impossible standard is the standard. There isn't any other standard by which we are to measure love. She continues, love one another as I have loved you, Jesus said. And Paul said, the husband must give his wife the same sort of love that Christ gave to the church when he sacrificed himself for her. Christ gave himself to make her holy, having cleansed her through the baptism of his word, to make her an altogether glorious church. The requirements go on and on. Elizabeth Elliot continues, ponder this love. It's a far cry from the soupy, selfish sentiment the world calls love. It's got nothing to do with it, really. It's a high and holy summons to forget yourself. All of us have failed. Do we change the standard? Do we lower the bar? Does the bullseye change because we failed? No. We go to God. We confess our sins. We confess our need. We look for the Spirit of God to freshly pour out grace. Who does grace come to? Those who are humble. God's opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. And so we recognize this. I want to look at a biblical passage that enlarges this idea of the call of God upon men to biblical manhood. It's one of the most inspiring passages I know of in the scriptures. Some of you who've been in the ministry here for many years, you've perhaps heard me uh, share out of this passage. It really is one of my favorites. Um, it's a passage in the Old Testament that talks about David's mighty men. Those who were gathered around him who had places of prominence in, in the ministry of David. If you'll turn to 2 Samuel chapter 23. Because it fleshes out just some of the qualities of biblical manhood that I want the Holy Spirit to bring me into. And I hope when we're done, every one of you men will say, I want in on this. I need God for this. But I believe with the Spirit of God and the equipping of the Word of God, God wants to do great things through men in this hour. And he wants to display, he wants to display his heart through men in the body of Christ. The stage is set. As I said before, there's a complete vacuum, a complete vacuum of understanding of manhood. We're going to be looking at 2 Samuel chapter 23. We'll pick it up in verse 8. I think what I'm going to do is read the entire section, then go back 
I'm not going to, going to go into great detail, but you're going to read about, we're going to read about some of the, the mighty men around David and some of the things that were described about them. This is an inspiring passage. By the way, I, Ben, I, I asked you a, a number of years ago to write your thoughts on this passage, and you, you wrote them for me. Uh, I still have what you wrote for me. It's handwritten. Um, I want to thank you very, very much. Very inspiring. In other words, it's a passage that you and I have talked about, and this is a great section. Section Second Samuel chapter 23, verse 8. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Joshua Bashabeth, the Tachmanite, chief among the captains. He was called Adino the Esnite because he had killed 800 men at one time. After him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle, and the men of Israel had retreated. He arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to plunder. And after him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Hararite. The Philistines had gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. So the people fled from the Philistines. But he stationed himself in the middle of the field, defended it, and killed the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. Then three of the thirty chief men went down at harvest time and came to David at the cave of Adullam. And the troop of Philistines encamped in the valley of Rephaim. David was then in the stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David said with longing, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of the water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. So the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord. And he said, Far be it from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is this not the blood of the men who went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink, drink it. These things were done by the three mighty men. Now, Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was chief of another. He lifted his spear against 300 men, killed them, and won a name among these three. Was he not the most honored of three? Therefore, he became their captain. However, he did not attain to the first three. Beniah was the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man from Kabzeel, who had done many deeds. He had killed two lion-like heroes of Moab. He had also gone down and killed a lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. And he killed an Egyptian, a spectacular man. The Egyptian had a spear in his hand, so he went down to him with a staff, wrested the spear out of the Egyptian's hand, and killed him with his own spear. These things Beniah the son of Jehoiada did, Jehoiada did, and won a name on the, among the three mighty men. He was more honored than the thirty, but he did not attain to the first three. And David appointed him over his guard. Now verses 24 through 29 <clears throat> give us the names of other mighty men with, uh, with, with no description of their particular exploits. So I want to talk about some of these mighty men because... These are inspiring, inspiring stories. They're written for us. They're written so we can learn, so we can, in a sense, be inspired today. I won't touch on all the details. It would take too long. And um, I want to give this passage to all of you as a passage for continued study. Uh, but we'll start with Joshua Bashebeth, the Tachmanite, also called Adino the Ezrite, verse 8. What does it, what does it tell us? He killed 800 at once. That's pretty amazing. Um, what's significant about this man, I think, is found in part, at least, in his name. Joshua Bashabeth basically means in the seat. The Tachmanite means wisdom. He's in the seat of wisdom. 
Hadino the Esnite is basically a bit of a redundancy that means he was sharp, really sharp. He sat in the seat of wisdom, and he was sharp. I thought about this, and I thought, you know how you kill 800 at one time? In order to kill the enemy, you have to identify the enemy. You have to know who the enemy is. You have to know right from wrong. You have to know good from evil. You have to know truth from error. You have to know wisdom from above versus the wisdom that's earthly, sensual, devilish. How do we learn that? I believe he was a man of the word. I want to challenge you, brothers. We've got to be men of the word. We need the word of God in our lives. The clarity, the sharpness of mind that we see in a man like this, Adino the Ezrite or Esnite, what is that sharpness from? What, what does he tell us? There needs to be a clarity of thinking. Brothers, I don't get that from reading the newspapers. We won't get that from just lounging away on the internet. We get that from the Word of God. The Word of God is able to make you wise to salvation. The Word of God is given to us. It's inspired for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be equipped, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We've got to be men of God. We don't know right from wrong. We don't, it, it, it might have been evident, evident. You might say, well, you know, back then the Philistines were obvious. I'm telling you today, the enemy isn't that obvious. We need the clarity that comes from the word of God. Some people say, well, you know, there's a lot of disagreements about the Bible. I want to say this. At least ask the question, what does the Bible say? Even if you get it wrong from that point, at least start by asking the question. Saying that, well, a lot of people disagree, so we won't even look at it. That's a guaranteed miss. I mean, that's an absolute guaranteed miss. You know, some people miss the bullseye, so <laughs> blindfold me, Dar. <laughs> that's ridiculous. I need the clarity that comes from the Word of God. A couple of weeks ago, we had a memorial service for Don Colbert here. It was a very, very special time. I know some of you there. Um, Fantastic sharing by a number of people. It, re it really was rich. In some ways, it was, it was fitting for a brother who had served so faithfully for so many years. It was, it was really rich. Um, in my sharing, I tried to capture just one aspect of Don's contribution to the ministry here particularly in his function as an elder. Because I sat with Don as part of the leadership team since September of 1981. Same, same time I was set in as an elder, he was set in as a deacon. We served together a number of years later. Uh, he was set in as an elder as well. We've spent a lot of time in meetings, a lot of time praying, a lot of time processing opportunities for the ministry, challenges in the ministry. And the picture I have of Don is this, of a man who, meeting after meeting, would sit quietly. I might introduce something or one of the other brothers. We would process options, challenges, ministry potential, struggles, Don would sit quietly, and I realized over time I would wait for the moment. And Don would say, that's a lot of opinions. What does God say? A lot of things we could do. What does God say? That's nice, boys. <laughs> Appreciate all the mental gymnastics. But what does God say? Joshib Bashabeth, the Tachmanite. I see him as a man who said, what does God say? What does God say? What does God say? Does God say this is up? Then it's up. If God says it, we're going to go in that direction. Again, I find a lot of discouraging writing 
in the current moment from people who are basically saying, you know, there's a lot of disagreements about the Bible and some people have gotten it wrong and this and that. And, you know, you could you at least ask the question. Get in there, brothers. Get into the Word of God. Start. Exercise spiritual muscle by saying, God, what do you say? Hebrews chapter 5, in the section where the the recipients of the letter of Hebrews are basically being told, by this time, you should be well beyond where you are now. That's, that's tough. That's tough language. And he says, strong meat is for the mature. Those who have their senses trained to discern between good and evil. How do we know the difference between good and evil? The Word of God, it says earlier in the book of Hebrews, is quick, it's alive, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing asunder between the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I want to encourage you, be a people who say, what does God's Word say? It's a great idea, great idea, great idea, possibility. What does God's Word say? Be rooted in God's word. Next, Eleazar, the son of Dodo. Verses 9 and 10. What does it tell us about him? After him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle. And the men of Israel had retreated. That's significant. That's really significant. Everybody else took off. What's Eliezer going to do? Let's continue. He arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to plunder. And what that means is after he won the battle, then everybody came to, to, to pick up the spoils. That's a great time to show up. <laughs> but they did. And his battle, in a sense, his victory was shared by others. I want you to see something. This is a man who's not following the Lord because of the crowd. He's not phased by the fact that everybody retreats. You know what he says? Doesn't matter. I'm going in the right direction. I was going in the right direction. I am going in the right direction. I'll continue going in the right direction. And it doesn't matter who goes with me. That's a tough one. That's a tough one. You know, I sometimes tell the story of my early, early discipleship uh, after I came to Christ in the you know, late summer of 1973. I was brought to the Lord by a young man. I think he was probably 24 years old or so at the time. And he was part of a, an informal fellowship group on Long Island. And they were getting together very regularly, Monday night, Wednesday night, Friday night, Saturday night. Somewhere between 20 and 30 regularly were showing up. And if we didn't have times of worship and Bible study, we were on the streets doing evangelism. We were having coffee houses, um, some great things happening. So my, my first year as a believer, I'm on Long Island going to community college, Monday night, Wednesday night, Friday night, Saturday night, I'm part of this. And it's like, it's like, a, like a, hot, a greenhouse of like young people growing. Um, there were a couple of older guys who were part of the, um, part of the group. They were, they were really noticeably older. I think they were 30. Um, uh, but we let them in anyway, right? Uh, If you're around in the 60s, you know that people over 30 were always suspect. Um, <laughs> that was the water we were drinking from. <laughs> so we had this group of people. And then after that first year, I came up to Potsdam uh, to attend uh, Potsdam College. And uh, then I went back after, after my first year here. I got back to Long Island. I was very excited about being able to spend the summer with, uh, with these folks. Come to find out, 
I get there, where is brother so-and-so? You know, he kind of backslid. Well, where's brother so-and-so? Well, he got upset with brother so-and-so, and he doesn't come anymore. And I'm like, these are the people I was marching with. I'm at Potsdam thinking we're still arm in arm and <laughs> we're going on with Jesus. I get back to Long Island, it's like a bomb went off. Six months later, I'm back at school. The guy who led me to the Lord dies, age 26. I get back to Long Island next summer, and the 30-year-old guy who was basically the leader of this study He had run off with one of the girls in the study, had tried unsuccessfully to persuade his wife that polygamy was a good thing. She didn't buy it. And so their marriage and their lives are gone belly up. And so I'm basically two years into my walk with Jesus, I'm looking around saying, where is everybody? Where is everybody? The guy that led me to the Lord, he's passed away. Others have fallen away. This is like the, the guy who was the leader. I, we all respected him. He's an excellent Bible teacher. He's now off with the girl and the wife. And I just, I'm like, you know what? I got to serve Jesus. I got to serve Jesus anyway. If my walk with Christ was dependent on the people around me, it wasn't, it wasn't on the rock. I've got to follow Jesus. Eleazar is significant because he sticks with it even when everybody runs. Men of God, I want to say to you, you've got to decide who you're following. And you will be tested. And today I hope we all at the end of this say, I'm going to follow Jesus. You will be tested in it. You will be tested in it. May the Holy Spirit help us. Verse 11, Shama, the son of Agi, the Herorite. Verse tw verses 11 and 12. After him was Shama, the son of Agi, the Herorite. The Philistines had gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. So the people fled from the Philistines. Okay, basically, the Philistines took over the field. This is their food supply. But he stationed himself in the middle of the field, defended it, and killed the Philistines. So the Lord brought, brought about a great victory. It doesn't tell us that this man, Shammah, the son of Ag the Herorite, liked lentils. <laughs> this wasn't about him. There were invaders who are basically plundering the people. And he basically said, I am going to stand. It's not about me. It's not about what I get. It's because there are others. Every man of God, whether married, with children, no children, or single, is going to walk through life at times and say, this isn't working out for me. I'm not getting what I thought I would get. You know? Got married thinking marital bliss. And all I'm getting is marital blisters. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't working out for me. You'll have those moments. Guaranteed. What do you do? You say, it's not about me. It's not about me not about me. You know, I have, I thank God for just being able to walk with Jesus. I mentioned I came to Christ in 1973. I've been serving in ministry now, you know, on staff at CFC since September of 1980. Um, so thankful, so thankful for the people God placed around me. When people, I, when I'm ever, I'm anywhere and I, you know, people ask me what, what's been significant in your life? to keep you in the ministry. I'm like, the people. It's the people around me. 
But the reality is there have been hard times. I mean, really hard times. I mean, I can remember times when I'm thinking to myself, 10, 12 years into the ministry, you know that teaching degree in music is still valid. <laughs> that certification you have. <laughs> you know, teaching, you know, fifth graders how to play the violin wasn't easy, but it wasn't like this. <laughs> Why do you ask those questions? It's not working out for me. It's not about you. It's not about you. Shama, the son of A.G. the Herorite, risked his own life for the sake of the people around him. It was for others that he did it. Let's continue. Verse 13. The three. This is a great section. Then three of the 30 chief men went down at harvest time and came to David at the cave of Bedullam, and the troop of Philistines encamped in the valley of Rephaim. David was then in the stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David said with a longing, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of the water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. So the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord. And he said, Far be it from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is this not the blood of the men who went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. These things were done by the three mighty men. Wow. I want to say a couple of things about these three. Firstly, there's something we need to learn from their resourcefulness. They're like, David wants some of that water. I got a plan. Can you imagine when the guy says, I got a plan, and the others are like, you're kidding. Really? For water? So they're resourceful. Secondly, though, they're willing to serve another man and his vision. It's really big, guys. They're secure enough in themselves to say, you know what? We're going to do it for David. Why? It's just water. You know, who's he? It's David. God's raised him up. We're going we're gonna to do it. That kind of security allows you to link arms with other men, to be faithful, loyal, committed, and to serve a vision that's beyond yourself. There's an epidemic in our day of men who are filled with pride and insecurity who will not serve the vision of anyone but themselves. And they claim it as an emblem of honor when in fact it reveals the very pride and insecurity in their own lives. These three were ready to say, you know what? We're going to do it. God raised them up. And we're going to get behind them. Let's continue. A couple more and then we'll close. Verse 18, Abishai. This is a good one. Now Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was chief of another three. He lifted his spear against 300 men, killed them, and won a name among these three. Was he not the most honored of three? Therefore, he became their captain. However, he did not attain to the first three. Or after you read about somebody killing 800 at once, you're thinking, why would somebody be only kill 300? Why, why is he listed? Um, there's something significant about Abishai, and it's this. He's related to David. He's the nephew of David. Was he numbered among these mighty men because he was the king's nephew. No. You know why he was numbered among the mighty men? Because he rose to the occasion. He killed 300. Could have rested on his laurels and said, hey, I ought to be here just because, you know, Uncle Dave. My uncle's king. I have a right to be here. No. 
he earned it. He came into his own. He wasn't qualified among the mighty men because of his relationship with David. I want to say, though, he wasn't disqualified because of his relationship with David. This is going to be important. This is going to be important. I've heard foolish talk for years about nepotism. Foolish talk. I want to say I'm thrilled when I see generations being raised up to serve Christ. I'm thrilled at it, and I want to see more of it. Now, having said that, do we put people in positions of leadership and authority because they're related? No, we don't. But we don't deny them that either. You know, what I say to my sons, what I say to my sons-in-law, it's great. Prove it. You're a man of God? Kill some Philistines. Show your stuff. You're not getting a title just because you're related to me. You know, Alan Daniels has a tremendous legacy. He's particularly gifted in the, the skilled trades. His sons aren't deacons because they're his sons. They're deacons because they're really good. You know, Darlene and I often say as we're driving along, just talking about the churches and praying, we often say, every church needs a Daniels. I mean, really, if I could clone some of them and just, every church. Now, I was thinking about Dave and Nate. You know, Dave, great reputation as a painter. You know, Nate now, carrying on the family tradition. Now, it's possible that some people hired Nate initially because they thought, well, you know, the old man's pretty good. I'll, I'll give him a shot. <laughs> but at some point, Nate's got to paint good houses. He's got to do a good job. Being related to someone might, you know, might open a door for you, but you've got to do the work. I want to say something. Foolish talk about nepotism. You've got to understand the devil is in that kind of talk. That is not God. Now, a few years ago, somebody said to me, well, you know, I got this problem, all this nepotism at CFC. And I said, what, what nepotism? And they said, well, you know, your you're, 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 you're family. I said, it's like, we're in the middle, by the way, at that time of like a really big deal at CFC Canton. And I said to them, can you think of anybody better than Jamie Sinclair to be leading us through this? I said, well, I guess not. I said, he's killing Philistines. Can you think of anybody better than Daniel Paladin to be raising up that church in Potsdam to pioneer the, the next season of ministry? They said, no, I guess not. I said, he's killing Philistines. Now, if people related to us aren't getting the job done, that's a problem. But this man, Abishai, He's not listed among the mighty men because he's David's nephew. He kills 300 Philistines. That's really, really significant. Saints, I want to say something. You've got to put that lie away. I mean, you've got to absolutely put that lie away. Um, my sons, your sons, my daughters, your daughters, may they, may they be raised up. You know, what, is the, what does the scripture say in Psalm 144? Uh, may your sons be uh, um, uh, plants, mature in their youth. May your daughters be like pillars sculptured in palace style. Don't we want that? That's what we want. That's what we're looking for. And the enemy wants to crush it. Don't let him. Don't let him do that. Abishai wasn't there simply because he was David's nephew but he wasn't disqualified because he was David's nephew. Last one, Benaiah, verses 20 to 23. And this is, this is a great one. This is a great one to, to close on. Benaiah was the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man from Kabzeel, who had done many deeds. He had killed two lion-like heroes of Moab. He also had gone down and killed the lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. And he killed an Egyptian, a spectacular man, the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, so he went down to him with a staff, wrested the spear out of the Egyptian's hand, and killed him with his own spear. These things Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, Jehoiada did, and won a name among the three 
mighty men. He was more honored than the 30, but he did not attain to the first three, and David appointed him over his guard. Benaiah, this is, this is a great story. Again, I'm just touching a few, few thoughts as we go through these. Um, so he kills a lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. When you go to battle, what are the things you want to choose? The time and the place. Okay? You study Gettysburg and all these major battles, and what are the, what are they, what are the generals, what are they jockeying for? The right position, the right timing. Where's the worst place to fight a lion? In a pit. I mean, you are stuck. Okay? And can you think of worse conditions than snow and mud and all that? You know, that's not it. That's, that's like, that's the time you don't. And you know what? This man says, today's the day. I don't get to choose my circumstances. I don't get to choose the hour in which I was born. You know, I'm, I'm, I don't know what the term is, but I'm kind of like, is it melancholy? I'm not sure what it is. Sometimes I think, oh, kind of wish I had been born, you know, and I think about times in the past, or even, you know, I think about the future, and I'm, and I'm like, well, guess what, Rick? <laughs> you weren't born then. You were born when you were born. And the challenges you face, you might not like them. You might think they're particularly hard. You might say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't choose this in a million years. And the Lord says, tough. I've got you there. And that's where Benaiah is. To add to the difficulties, we find Benaiah going to battle without a spear. Oh, that's great. And what would you think? Well, I'm just going to wait till the conditions are better. I'm going to wait, you know, till it's not snowing. I'm going to wait till it's I'm not in a pit. I'm going to wait till I have a spear. You know, I'll, I'm going to wait. And Benaiah says, "Listen, the battle came to me. I don't get to choose it. I don't get to select it. I don't get to I don't get to pick the day in which I live. I don't get to pick the enemies I face." And you know what Benaiah says? I'm going after it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take what I have. I'm going to, you know, I, I can picture him saying, God, you're going to have to help me, but I, I'm, not, I'm not running away from this. I'm going to face the battle. I'm going to run to it. Brothers, I want to say this. There are hardships you're facing. There are challenges in your personal life. There are challenges, I mean, all over the place. I mean, I... I dread turning on the news these days. I'm thinking, is it possible I could turn on the news and find out I'm living some other time maybe, hopefully. You know, just, this is awful. The moment in which you live is, it is perilous times. And we could say, oh God, if I lived then, I would, I'd be a valiant warrior. Or, or if that was different, I, I could really serve you. But alas, here I am. In a pit, Snowy, no spear, when I face the, uh, you know, these spe spectacular, isn't that a great word in the New King James? He faced, he killed an Egyptian, a spectacular man. I wonder what that is, all right? And he says, you know what, I can't wait till the average guy comes. Wouldn't it, you know, I'd rather face an average guy, not a spectacular guy. And he says, no, Benaiah, Benaiah, I, this is my day. This is my destiny. This, this is my moment. This is it. You get to serve God today. You get to press in today. And I'll speak to you very, very personally. As a church, you're facing big challenges. I'm sorry. This is your day. You don't get to choose them. You didn't get to say, God, God, that challenge, can you take that one back? I'd, I'd rather have a different challenge. It doesn't work that way. And you have the opportunity to say, you know what? This is my moment. This is my day to seek God. This is actually my destiny. God chose in his infinite wisdom 
to cause me to be born in 1954 and to live life now, not some other time in the past, not some other time in the future, but to live now and to face these challenges. And you know what? I don't know what's going to happen. I, I've got a, a staff, and I'm facing spectacular enemies with spears. Oh, this doesn't look good. But this is my time. This is my destiny. Brothers, I'm not lowering the bar today. The Bible does not lower the bar. The, the Bible says, essentially, we are the men of God. It's time for us to grow up, to man up, and to seek God like we never have. I want to invite all the men to stand, all ages. I want to encourage you to take a look at 2 Samuel chapter 23 on your own in the coming days. It's so inspiring. Right now, I want us to ask for grace. Yes, we have missed the mark. Yes, we have at times shrunk back. Yes, we have at times thought we could just rest and just hopefully God would just change the things around us. But today's a day to say, God, forgive me, and I need fresh grace. Make me a man of your word, a man of wisdom, true wisdom, godly wisdom, not the wisdom of the world, but the wisdom from God. Give me the courage to continue to serve you even when the crowd disappears. Give me your heart so that I can live a life for the sake of those around me, not for what it gains me, but so that others will be strengthened. Give me the security and the resourcefulness that allows me to serve, to serve you, to serve with others, to serve the vision of others, and to be resourceful in the midst of it. Give me grace to give my everything in this moment not waiting until things are perfect, but recognizing this is my day, this is my destiny. God, there's something you want to do today. Father, I pray not only for my brothers, but for myself. Fresh grace, fresh grace, fresh grace. Father, and I pray that in a way the the coming days, such brokenness throughout our culture, there would be an emergence of the sons of God. Your word says, for the entire creation is groaning, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Father, I know that in the last day, there will be that glorious transformation when Christ returns. But I pray, O oh God, that in this hour, men of God would be raised up, humble, yet courageous and strong, to display the heart of God in very significant ways in their own homes, in the church, and in the world at large. Father, I ask for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, brothers. Amen. Wow. I'm inspired. I, uh, 
I'm going to release you in a minute. I was just thinking of that story, though, with uh, Benaiah and the pit with a lion on a snowy day. And uh, the picture I always have is just a group of guys walking up and looking down into a pit and seeing a lion down in a pit and thinking, man, there's a lion in this pit. Like it was like uh, kind of unexpected. And as the, there's a group of men standing around saying, what are we going to do? Suddenly, Benaiah is just jumping into the pit like a madman. Like, I'm going to go in this pit and take care of this lion. A little bit of tenacity, a little bit of, of uh, somebody, somebody in a way looking for, um, you know, where the enemy uh, needs to be defeated and uh, ready to jump in. Hey, I don't know what in your own even personal life uh, God is going to lead you to, uh, but uh, a lion in a pit in your life, uh, you know, if the enemy's working there, it needs to be dealt with. Get aggressive and be tenacious with the lions in your life um, and uh, don't let them just live in a pit. Don't feed it, you know. Go in there and, and uh, knock that thing dead. Amen. Father, we thank you today, Lord, for raising us up, Lord, to be, uh, to be warriors for you, to see uh, the enemy of our souls uh, defeated uh, step by step. Father, I thank you, Lord, for leading uh, your people. Uh, Lord, the, the, your word says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but you came, Jesus, to give life and give it more abundantly. I pray for life abundant for the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Fathers, enjoy uh, your day with your family. Be blessed.